According to legend, in 1819, a group of men bury a fabulous treasure in the Virginia countryside. The gold and silver and jewels worth tens of millions of dollars. Their leader, Thomas Beale, writes down the treasure's location in a secret code. He entrusts an innkeeper with its safekeeping, vowing to return. But then Thomas Beale vanishes. Not only does Thomas Beale disappear, his whole party disappears. It's a complete mystery. Years later, two brothers, George and Clayton Hart, take up the challenge of cracking Beale's mysterious code to recover his glittering treasure. During their 50-year quest, they turn to the world's most famous code breakers. And even the supernatural. But when someone is hot on the trail of a treasure, they will use every possible means at their disposal. In the 19th century, a seance was science. He genuinely believes that mesmerism will uncover the location of this treasure. Theirs is an extraordinary quest to unravel the mystery of Thomas Beale's lost treasure. The story begins in southern USA in 1897 at the offices of the Norfolk and Western Railroad Company in Roanoke, Virginia. Clayton Hart, a 25-year-old clerk, spent his working day transcribing documents for his employer. A man like Clayton Hart, his life is rather humdrum and boring, I think. A lot of rote clerical work, and I can imagine that he is looking at the world and saying there must be something more than my workaday existence. One summer morning, a senior colleague asked Hart to make copies of a document. It was a routine request, but this document was far from ordinary. Clayton Hart looks at the papers, and they've got sets of numbers on them. There's no context, no clues, no history, no nothing. It's just numbers. What are they for? Where does this lead? Clearly, these numbers are meant to signify something. They can engender that spark of curiosity. I must find out what this means. Hart's colleague explained that he believed the numbers could reveal the location of an extraordinary treasure. Buried for almost a century under the Virginia soil. As far as he knew, the treasure still lay undiscovered out there somewhere. This clerk in this big office can just suddenly imagine a completely different world and can imagine an adventure that is seeming to stare him right in the face. So you could see how that would be very exciting, a very exciting prospect and, and the opportunity to break out of his humdrum existence. So Clayton Hart doesn't know at this particular moment, of course, that this is going to be his life's work. He's going to dedicate his entire life to discovering the location of this treasure hoard. Clayton Hart made his own copies of the numbered pages and from his family home in Roanoke began work to decipher the strange and puzzling codes. The question is, does Clayton Hart have a chance of solving this cipher? He's an amateur, but it's not a big mathematical cipher. There's a trick to it. Maybe you can solve this. 
Clayton scoured the code for clues. He tried to identify patterns and establish relationships between the numbers. But after weeks of effort, he had got nowhere. He desperately needed to find a new lead if he had any hope of getting his hands on the buried treasure. So if you can't figure out the code, you can at least figure out who was the author of the code. What kind of a person was this author? He begins to speculate that perhaps if he had some biographical information, some knowledge about where they came from, then he could begin to try and unpick these codes. Hart made inquiries and soon received his first clue. He discovered that a man named James Ward had published a strikingly similar code in a pamphlet printed 12 years earlier in Lynchburg, Virginia. When Clayton Hart finds out about a pamphlet that was written only a decade before that, very similar sounding to what he's got. He's very excited. He has to go and see it. This is the only real clue he's got that isn't a number. Hart set out for Lynchburg, 50 miles away to the east. He scoured the city's bookshops for the mysterious pamphlet. Eventually, he found it. A small, 20-page booklet published in 1885 by a James B. Ward. What he reads is the Beale Papers, containing authentic statements regarding the treasure buried in 1819 and 1821 near Buford's in Bedford County, Virginia. On closer inspection, Hart noticed that the pamphlet contained three sets of numbers. The same numbers that had been puzzling him for weeks. You can almost feel his heart start to pound as he recognizes that this is the very same material that he has, which must have convinced him. Well, this is too much to be coincidental. There must be something true. This must be true. What an exciting thing. What's been a set of numbers is now treasure, actual treasure. Could it get any better than that? Clayton Hart had hit the jackpot. But who was the Beale referred to in the title? And where? was the mysterious treasure buried. Hungry for more clues, Clayton Hart read the pamphlet from cover to cover. Its pages contained a tangled story of mystery and intrigue. Hart learned that in 1821, a mystery man was a guest at the Washington Hotel in Lynchburg. He gave his name as Thomas Beale. He entrusted the hotel's proprietor, Robert Morris, with a locked box for safekeeping. This seems strange to us, but actually this was quite common. At this time, an innkeeper is actually one of the most trustworthy people that you can hand documents to. So many people would hand documents and private possessions to an innkeeper for safekeeping. Beale then disappeared without a trace. But several months later, Morris the innkeeper received word from his former guest. a letter from St. Louis instructing Morris that 
if Beale does not return after a certain period of time, 10 years, that Morris is to open this mysterious locked box. Hart read that Morris waited 23 years before opening the box. Inside, he discovered a stack of papers. One of which is a letter addressed to him. And in it is this fantastic account of how Thomas Beale came by this vast amount of gold and treasure while he was journeying in the West. The story goes that in 1817, Beale and a group of companions set out into the West to hunt buffalo. They journeyed from their home in Virginia, across country, towards the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Whilst exploring the rugged terrain, some of Beale's men made an amazing discovery. So he tells the story that uh, as they are hunting these buffalo, they stumble on a gold mine. The men abandoned the buffalo hunt and began extracting the gleaming ore. They spend 18 months, the 30 of them, toiling away, pulling out thousands of pounds of gold and silver, and they debate what it is that they want to do with this. How do they want to store it? How do they share it with their families? Clayton Hart read that Beale and his men had decided to take their wealth back to Virginia. En route, they stopped in St. Louis. There, they traded the ore for gold coins, silver bars, and precious jewels. They then transported their booty back to Virginia in two separate trips, one in 1819 and another in 1821. At that time, banks were not considered to be safe, so they stashed their fortune in a top secret location in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. The pamphlet explained. Beale then encoded the treasure's hidden location in an enciphered message. Hart was captivated. Could this treasure really be buried in the Virginia mountains? Hart read that along with the letter, Morris the innkeeper had found three sheets of paper inside the mysterious box. On each was written line after line of what seemed like random numbers. The pamphlet explained that these numbers form three enciphered messages written by Beale. Paper one, contained the exact location of the treasure. Paper two was an inventory of the treasure. And paper three was a list of to whom the treasure belonged. This is the moment where it all links together. It's perfect. It's a treasure hunt, and he's on the treasure hunt. It's his treasure. The question was, could this code be cracked to reveal the treasure's location? Clayton Hart turned the page searching for more clues. He read that the innkeeper, Morris, spent nearly 20 years trying to crack the codes. But the challenge defeated him. He passed the codes and Beale's letters to an unnamed friend.
that friend then wrestled with the problem for years and eventually made a breakthrough on paper too. Morris's unnamed friend makes a really good guess that what he's looking at in these ciphers is a dictionary cipher where each number tells you the index of a word in a book or paper or something. And by looking at the first letter of that word, you can decrypt the message. He tries lots of different books. He tries the Declaration of Independence. And wonderfully, marvelously, it comes out. Starting by consecutively numbering the words of the declaration, the innkeeper's friend began to decode the second paper. He referenced the code's numbers to the first letters of the numbered declaration's words. And amazingly, Beale's cipher began to unravel. So using the Declaration of Independence and going through these numbers, you might end up with the letters from the beginning, I-H-A-V-E-D-E-P. I have deposited. And then the rest of the message comes out in that way. The pamphlet contained a full transcription of the decoded second paper. It was as though Thomas Beale was speaking to Clayton Hart from beyond the grave. I have deposited in the county of Bedford, about four miles from Buford's, in an excavation or vault, the following articles. The first deposit consisted of 1,014 pounds of gold and 3,812 pounds of silver. The second consisted of 1,907 pounds of gold and 1,288 pounds of silver. Also, jewels obtained in St. Louis and valued at $13,000. Clayton Hart was overwhelmed. Here, in black and white, was not only evidence that the treasure was real, but also what it was worth. A truly phenomenal sum that today would be worth over $60 million. The pamphlet also included one vital clue to its location, that it was buried underground about four miles from a place called Buford's Tavern. So from the perspective of Clayton Hart, this is wonderful news because it means that the codes can actually be cracked. Hart was stunned. It then occurred to him, if the Declaration of Independence was the key to the second Beale paper, maybe other well-known published texts could unlock the first paper, the one that contained the precise location of the treasure. He was convinced that he was on the verge of becoming rich beyond his wildest dreams. Hart headed back to Roanoke, keen to test his theory. He enlisted the help of his brother, George, a trainee lawyer with dreams of opening offices in Washington, D.C. Of the two brothers, he's the more rational, more skeptical of the two. And Clayton tells his brother about what he's found, and his brother becomes interested. Clayton described his discoveries, and the two brothers began trying to trace the vital keys to the cipher-encoded papers. 
they began to examine paper one that contained the treasure's location. What the Hart brothers tried to do now is they try loads of different books and loads of different strategies with books. They count words in different ways. Perhaps it's every word, perhaps it's every other word. Perhaps you start numbering at the end. Perhaps you take the second letter. So they try many different methods of trying to solve paper number one. The brothers toiled for weeks, hunting for the key text that would unlock the location of Thomas Beale's treasure. But there are so many books, and you don't have to start on page one. You don't have to even start on the first word of a page. You can start anywhere. So where do you start? They try all kinds of things, but nothing really bites, nothing really works. After weeks of effort, the treasure's location was still locked in the code. It was clear the hearts must attack the puzzle from a different angle. So Clayton suggested a fresh and unconventional approach to their problem. He proposed that they could unlock the treasure's location through the power of mesmerism. Mesmerism is a 19th century and early 20th century science. By a combination of hypnotism and electrical currents, a subject would be rendered into a state of trance where they could cross over into another realm and they would describe what they were seeing. During the 1890s, Clayton Hart had witnessed these techniques in practice it's wonderful and had subsequently educated himself in the arts of mesmerism and hypnotism. He was convinced that he could mesmerize a medium and guide them back through time to Bedford County in 1819. The subject would see through the eyes of one of Beale's men and identify the location of the buried treasure. Clayton Hart is not an irrational man. He genuinely believes that this application of a scientific process of mesmerism will uncover the location of this treasure. One year later, in early 1898, the brothers agreed to conduct a seance. For this, they required a suitable medium. Clayton enlisted the help of a local 18-year-old man who had shown promise as a clairvoyant and crystal ball reader. George Hart sized him up as mild-mannered and seemingly disinterested in what was about to happen. Clayton began the mesmerism process. A typical mesmerist will sit an individual down in a chair and lay their hand upon the median nerve on the top of their arm and press hard to make a, a connection. The subject would then be handed into their other hand a mesmerist's coin, a piece of zinc wound with wire, so something like a battery. Then the mesmerist would rub their hands up and down this person's arm towards their head sending a spasm through the individual, which would render them unconscious, insensible, and they would cross over into another realm where they would describe their visions. The hearts could see that the mesmerism process was working as the medium gazed into the crystal ball, and as if transfixed, took on an unfamiliar personality. He begins to speak like this you know, rough-hewn backcountry, early 19th century man would have. He's mouthing words through a body and a, a persona that seems to have really changed into a whole new uh, person from the past. Believing that the medium was seeing events from the past, Clayton Hart ordered him to journey to Buford's Tavern in November 1819. 
to the day before the treasure was buried. The medium described that he could see a group of men inside the tavern building. He then followed the man who appeared to be their leader, Thomas Beale, upstairs. According to the medium, Beale placed his saddlebags on the bed and opened one of its pouches. Inside was a fortune in precious jewels. When he sees the treasure, the boy declares, I've never seen such a hoard in all my life. It beats any jeweler's show I've ever seen. And the, the Hart brothers are, are amazed. Clayton ordered the medium to go outside the tavern and investigate the party's wagons. The subject describes looking into the pots that are on these wagons and seeing gold and silver within these pots. Uh, this first person commentary seems to be just so vivid and so true to them that it provides just another brick in that wall, that foundation that they're building to support this, this story. Now convinced that the treasure was real, Clayton Hart focused his medium on identifying its secret location. He ordered him to follow the men's movements the next day when they went out to bury the treasure. According to the subject in the seance, he is describing that these two men who are out in the woods near Buford's Tavern are digging a hole and that they are paving it with stones. And on these stones, they are placing pots, placing more stones on top of the pots. And this is matching exactly what is in the Beale papers in terms of what is described about where the treasure has been hidden. All of a sudden, the medium snapped out of his mesmerized state. Their mesmerized subject gives them everything they need, except where the treasure is. But they, they, he fills out the story so beautifully, so vividly. It's like he was right there with Thomas Beale. The Hart brothers took stock of what exactly had just occurred. George is a skeptic. Clayton is a true believer. And they are not sure whether or not this evidence is real evidence or not. The boy has said something. Is it debatable? Is it, is it up for questioning? So they begin to chat with one another about whether or not they should follow this lead. Then the medium spoke. He told the brothers that he could lead them to the very spot where the treasure was buried. They said, how can it get any better? And they think, he can lead us to the treasure. The hearts really want this to be true. In the spring of 1899, George and Clayton Hart headed out into Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. Along with their 18-year-old medium, they scrambled through the wooded countryside. They headed for an inn that was once called Buford's Tavern, as the Beale papers had stated that the treasure was buried close by. They take the subject of the seance and he's hypnotized again. He then proceeds hound dog-like to sniff his way back to the spot where he remembers that this treasure is buried.
The three men tramped four miles through overgrown woodland. Suddenly, the medium stopped before darting off into the woods. He seems to know right where he's going. He jumps across a stream. He goes up a hill, down into an area where there's a little depression in the ground. And, and he acts as though he can see the treasure. Look, there it is. It's right there. This had to be the spot where Thomas Beale had buried his legendary treasure. For six hours, they shoveled load after load of moist Virginia soil. They're digging, and digging is hard work, but there's always that hope of treasure that, that keeps them going. And they're getting tired, they've been at it for several hours, and then it's Clayton's turn. And he digs and clunk. He hits a stone, a big stone. Tingling with anticipation, the brothers clear the dirt from the stone's edges. Treasure hunters live for a moment like this. They've been working so hard for so long, deciphering the, the codes, mesmerizing young boys. And what they end up finding is a hollow stone. And they think, wow, this is, this is my moment. This is the moment where we're going to uncover Thomas Beale's treasure. nothing underneath. Frustrated, Clayton asked the medium if they had made a mistake. Where was the treasure? Then he says, no, 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 it's not there. And he points to an area that's underneath an oak tree, saying, there, there, can't you see it? George Hart had lost all faith in their medium. The decision was made to return home. The next morning, Clayton still believed that the treasure was within his grasp. He's clearly bought into this story lock, stock, and barrel, and has devoted, I think, so much of his own energy to this that he just can't accept that this is the end of the road. So without his brother, he actually then goes back to the spot, to the oak tree. But this time, instead of shovels, he brings dynamite. In a desperate last attempt, Clayton Hart set the charge, lit the touch paper, and ran. When the air cleared, Clayton frantically started digging. But again, nothing. Thomas Beale's riches had eluded him once again. The next four years passed without any progress. but Clayton Hart remained as keen as ever to find Beale's lost treasure. Clayton Hart is a true believer. 
He thinks that one new lead is all that it'll take for him to uncover the hidden treasure. He returned to the Beale papers and focused in on the pamphlet's publisher, James B. Ward. He decides to go and find out who he is and see what he's got to say, and if he can help find the treasure. Clayton Hart made inquiries. Who was the mysterious Mr. Ward? Clayton Hart finds out that James Ward is indeed a real person, and he lives in Lynchburg, not that far from where they are. So he goes to try and find him. He journeyed to Lynchburg to meet Ward. Hart recounted the brothers' adventures trying to find Beale's lost treasure and asked if Ward had any new leads. And Ward tells Hart point blank, everything in the pamphlet I published is true. Everything that you read about the expedition and the gold and Robert Morris and the unnamed friend cracking the code, it's all true. But Ward couldn't provide any further details. Nothing that could help Clayton find the treasure. Clayton returned to Roanoke in despair. The last living connection to the mystery had led nowhere. And the location of Beale's riches remained unknown. another 20 years before the Hart brothers got their next lead. George Hart was by this time a qualified lawyer, living in Washington, D.C. In 1924, he read a magazine article about a Colonel George Fabian and the work of American codebreakers during the First World War. He was the founder of what's effectively an independent code-breaking research facility, a think tank, that uh, was of great use to the American military in the First World War. And Hart thinks, wow, maybe Fabian's crew can crack this code. With Clayton's blessing, George Hart mailed Colonel Fabian with the story of the brothers' adventures, together with the codes and all the information they knew about the mystery. Intrigued, Fabian wrote back to George Hart. The problem has my interest, and I am writing in the vain hope that either you or Clayton Hart can give us further information, because the psychology of it is about all we have to go on in picking our point of attack. In the meantime, we will retain the pamphlet and work on it as we can find the time to do so. Fabian pointed out what the Hart brothers already knew, that in order to crack the ciphers on papers one and three, he first needed to discover the correct keys. But he said, it's difficult, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to break a code in a vacuum, devoid of all context that we understand. And so in some sense, this response, which Hart hoped would really be uh, sort of a magic key to open this lock is simply more of what they already understood, which is that until you really know more about how this code was created, cracking it is fiendishly difficult. Fabian's attempts to decipher the Beale papers went nowhere. He decided to enlist the talents of his two top cryptologists, William and Elizabeth Friedman, were both accomplished code breakers and pioneers of new cryptographic techniques 
born out of the First World War. William and Elizabeth Friedman are two probably of the most famous code breakers in the United States. They would often look at some of these unsolved ciphers and sort of crack them for fun. The Freedmans studied the Beale ciphers and applied their expertise to the problem of breaking them. Freedmans look at these ciphers and they use their toolbox. But the difference between them and other people is that William Friedman invented the toolbox. And so when he and his wife look at this thing, they look with incredibly piercing vision. The more the Freedmans looked at the Beale papers, the more they suspected they were not what they claimed to be. In a letter to Clayton Hart written in 1938, Elizabeth Friedman gave their damning verdict. Such maps, when examined, have almost invariably proved to be forgeries. Foisted upon an unsuspecting public which, thanks to the double lure of buried treasure and cryptographic form, have persisted throughout the years since they first appeared in 1885. It is likewise believed that the cryptogram, which you forwarded, is nothing more or less than a hoax. In other words, the Freedmans were confident that the Hearts had wasted their time on a wild goose chase. It is perhaps the, the most crippling sort of blow to the belief of the hearts and other people that this could possibly be um, an actual story, an actual true story. That the code breaking experts of the time come to the conclusion that there's no truth in this at all. The Freedmans had no doubt that the story of Thomas Beale's treasure was a cleverly written hoax probably created to sell pamphlets. But if it was a hoax, who had perpetrated it? One theory points the finger at a Lynchburg newspaper editor named John William Sherman. In 1885, John William Sherman purchases the Lynchburg Virginian newspaper. Very quickly, the Lynchburg Virginian gets into financial difficulties. And Sherman, who is known as a famous writer of dime novels, strikes upon an idea that perhaps to reverse the fortunes of the Lynchburg Virginian, he should publish something that sells. Some researchers now believe that Sherman created the Beale Papers as a money spinner. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. He certainly had the experience and the background and had the motive in uh, being in a, a difficult financial position with his, with his newspaper. There is another piece of evidence that supports this theory. Advertisements for the Beale Papers pamphlet run a total of 84 times from 1885 and only ever in one newspaper the Lynchburg Virginia. Who on earth would publish an advert 84 times? Who could afford to do that? The only person that could really do that would be the owner, John William Sherman. And there's one more startling connection. Sherman's first cousin was none other than the man Clayton Hart had visited in 1903 the publisher of the Beale Papers, James B. Ward. John Sherman cannot publish the Beale Papers under his own name. He's well known in Virginia as the editor of this newspaper, and it's known that he's also in financial difficulties. So he enlists his cousin to act as agent, James Ward, finishing the deception 
and authenticating the text as true. In other words, it seems there never was a Beale or a treasure. The whole thing was a fabrication. But Clayton Hart was convinced that the papers were real. He went to his grave, believing that Thomas Beale's treasure was out there somewhere. Despite the evidence that the Beale papers were a hoax, the mystery still continued to intrigue treasure hunters and code breakers alike. In the 1960s, a computer scientist named Carl Hammer entered the quest to decipher the mysterious Beale codes. He put the number sequences through the most advanced computers of the day. He even identified patterns in the ciphers, but still, he failed to crack the codes. In the 1980s, a historical journal from the 1820s emerged that told of a party closely fitting the description of Beals. Was this evidence that Thomas Beale and his men really had existed? And if Beale was real, was the treasure also? We know that Beale and his associates didn't return for the box that they had entrusted with Morris. And that Beale disappears after the 1820s. So, what happened to Thomas Beale? Did something sinister happen? Did he go and dig up the treasure himself? There are many possible outcomes in 19th century America. One theory is that Beale and his party may have returned to retrieve their precious booty. Another is that before they could do so, they came to an untimely end. If that's the case, then Beale's treasure could still lie undiscovered. Clayton and George Hart spent 50 years of their lives trying to solve the mystery of Beale's treasure. A mystery that continues to captivate treasure hunters and code breakers to this day. The Beale ciphers, the Beale papers, are a source of incredible interest to people, and they, they continue to be, even, you know, 100 years later, and they will be 200 years later because, and I speak as a literary critic, they are so well written. I myself don't think there is treasure sitting somewhere in Virginia. I think there is a person who published an absolutely fantastic adventure story. To those who do believe the legend, there is a fortune in gold, silver and jewels buried six feet under the Virginia soil. And finding it is simply a matter of cracking the mystery of Thomas Beale's codes. If people just forget about the, the legends, if they can just look at the numbers, everything you need to know is in the numbers. For me, the Beale ciphers are crackable, but it's a mystery. It's a great mystery.